Uh, listen, I, I um, tonight as we as we start to talk about what the Lord's laid on my heart, um, it's so interesting uh, how this message come about. Is actually a message of another message of another message, and 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 taking two or three messages and putting them together and kind of going where I feel like the Lord's going. I've been praying, Lord, where where do I need to go on Saturday night? Where do I need to go on Saturday night? And finally, this morning, He kind of gave me where I where, you know, where I was supposed to go. And and so we're gonna we're gonna talk um, tonight about uh, a topic that everyone in the room has. Everyone in the room has a measure of this in their lives. Everyone. And I know that because you're here in this room. Every one of you have heard this. This is the probably the one of the biggest Christianese words that will ever speak. Right? You know the the Christianese that that goes on. Um. And the the title of my message tonight, and we're going to be in a passage of scripture in in uh, Hebrews that. Um, Man, I don't feel like you even measure up with these people. You know where I'm talking about, Trenton? In, 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 in Hebrews chapter 11. Of course, we're going to talk about faith tonight. And the title of my message is The Faith That Pleases. And it's interesting because I'm not sure we fully understand this word. And I'm not sure I really feel fully understood it. And, and as the Lord is unpacking more and more of it, I don't know. You know, this might be just a, a a message, and then maybe we might have to pick this back up after the the Got Questions series, as the Lord is kind of unpacking it more and more in my eyes. But um, you know, it's it's interesting what he's um, what he's trying to communicate to me, and, and hopefully it'll be interesting to you tonight as I uh, as I attempt to unpack it. Um, and so let's let the uh, let's let the word just kind of resonate. There's a lot of scripture here tonight. Um, especially to start with, but try to follow along. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to follow along because it's always good to get it in your Bible where you, where you see it. And in, in it's uh, um, Hebrews chapter 11. I want to pick it up in verse uh, 1, of course, where it talks about, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendations. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God, commending him by accepting his gift, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he commended the world and, excuse me, condemned the world and became an heir of the righteous that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to, the, to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise. As in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, as many as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. 
this all died these excuse me all died in faith not having received the things promised but having seen them and greeting them from afar and having knowledge that they were strangers and exiles on this on the earth for the people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out they would have had opportunity to return but as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who received the promises from, the, from in the act of offering up his only son, of whom he has said, through Isaac shall your offspring, offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons, sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by the parents because they saw that his child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was growing up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people, of, people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. In this passage of scripture, one of the things that you obviously have to see is everything goes off of by faith. By faith, by faith, by faith. It goes over and over and over. And you look at this and you think, wow, this faith, this thing that each one of us is supposed to have if we're professing a followers of Jesus Christ, we are saved by that faith. That faith that says that we have hope. I hope tonight that in this room, the measure of faith that you have will give you the hope to continue, to press on for the high calling that we have on our lives. We see these great people. And when I read this, when I read this passage of scripture, I think, man, there is no way. There's no way I can have as much faith as some of these people had. You know, we see the exhibiting of faith by, by uh, Abel when he give his first fruits to the Lord. We see the, the, the fruit of uh, Enoch the guy had so much faith that the Lord didn't even, even allow him to die. He just took him. That's pretty cool. How many of you want to sign up for that one? Right? To have, but here's the thing. Will we sign up? Because will we have that much faith? Will we exhibit as much faith as what he did to, you know, to have the Lord take us as, as opposed to dying? We, we look at Noah. You know, I think about old Noah. And you think about the warning that God gave Noah. Right? Now, there's some argument that, with this, and so I'm going to just, just mention it. It's not written in stone. The, theologians um, argue about this kind of stuff all the time. But just for the sake of, of tonight, let's look at this. By faith, Noah, being warned of God concerning events as yet unseen, there are some discussions that up until that point, rain had never fallen on the earth. Yet he was warned by the Lord to build an ark. 
That takes some faith. Can you imagine how long that thing took to build? I mean, think about it. I mean, they have one in what, Tennessee now? Some, some guy uh, built a, a replica of the Ark up in Tennessee or something like that. And it's like, it's, the thing is huge. You see pictures of it on the internet. It's like huge. And you have to wonder, wow. Now think about, think about in Noah's day, building something like that. And having the faith to continue when your brothers are going, what the heck are you doing? You have lost your mind. It's one thing to have faith, but it's another thing to endure the rhetoric, isn't it? You know, <laughs> I've been there. I've had some rhetoric put on my, on my life. Like, what do you think you're doing? You're going to be this man of God? Like, what is that? It's interesting, though, as you see and you start reading down through here and you see the great people of faith. Abraham obeyed when, it, when he was called to go somewhere. He didn't even know where he was going. Think about the faith that that took just to go, to, to pick up and go and not know where you're going or where you're going to stop, but just to continue to go. You know, you look at um, uh, the testing. I don't know about you, but I, th I, you know, going, that's not a big deal for me. I mean, think about this. <laughs> Jill and I have been, we, you know, we lived in Canada, then we immigrated to the United States, then we, you know, we spent some time in the United States, and then we find ourselves in Florida. So going, that's no big deal for us. We're just like, hey, we're going to go there. Let's just pick up things and go. We'll figure it out when we get there. But this testing of Isaac, putting his firstborn on an altar, who's in for that one? No. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, it's like, really, that's some testing, right? But he passed the test, knowing that, that God had promised him and having the faith in God that he promised him, if he did end up having to kill him, he would raise him from the dead. That's some faith. That's some faith. And I reconcile my life to these great men and women. And I say, that's what's so great about this, women, is that you're included in this deal. Right? It's all inclusive. I think about old Abraham, and I think of Sarah. And, and we look at these people, and we see, especially in this chapter, the great faith that they had. But, you know, the great thing is, is that when we read Scripture, we understand that they had some lacking too, didn't they? And they should give us some hope when we actually read their stories. I mean, how many times did old Abraham lie that Sarah was his sister? Because he thought somebody was going to hurt him, right? Don't worry about poor Sarah, what she's going to have to go through. I <laughs> look after my own self. Yeah, a lot of faith, right? But you think about th these people are counted as having great faith. And I used to think, man, I'm never going to have that much faith. I'm never going to get there where I can be called a man of faith. Because that's really, I mean, that's kind of a goal, isn't it? To be called a man of faith or a woman of faith. I used to think it was impossible, but then I realized after reading some scripture that each one of us, hear me now, each one of us is given a measure of faith. Everyone is given a measure of faith. Look what it says in Romans chapter 12. I want to pick it up in verse 3, and, and, and I'm reading more than what I need, but I want to give you the, the context of, of what it's talking about here, because it's, it's, it's extraordinarily important for us to understand the measure of faith that we've been given. And so in verse 3, it says, for, for, for by grace given to me, this is Paul speaking, he says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in the body, we, we have many members, and the members do not all... Do not do all the same function. So we, though many, are one in Christ, and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in, a, in our serving, the one that who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his ex exhortation, 
the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And so what's Paul saying here is he's saying that each one of us have been given a measure of faith. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that each one of us has been given a measure of faith? How can I confidently stand up here and say everyone in the building has a measure of faith? Well, hear me, friend, because if you're even if you're in the room today and you really don't know Jesus, Jesus has given you a measure of faith to walk through the doors. He has given you a measure of faith to draw, drawing you into relationship with him, a relationship that's real, a relationship that's personal, a relationship that's meaningful. But you didn't have that measure of faith because he had to give it to you in order for you to even be drawn. Jesus is very clear, and I think it's John 6, uh, 44, where he says that no one can come to the Father except that he be drawn into relationship. And so just the fact that you're in this room this, tonight would tell me that, number one, God is drawing you. Number two, that God has given you the faith to be here because you now know that he exists. One of the things that when I talk to people, oftentimes I get them to, to, to agree. Can you agree on one verse? Because one verse really tells everything. If you can re agree on the first verse of the Bible, you're, 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 you're on your way. If you can agree with the first verse of the Bible, you're on your way to really beginning to have the wisdom, all wisdom, what the proverb says, wisdom begins at the fear of the Lord. And understand that this faith that he's given us, he's given each one a measure of faith. One of the things I wanted to point out to you is that the gift of grace is faith. The gift of grace is faith because the grace of Jesus Christ has ex extending to us is, the, is extending the measure of faith, number one, to get us to come into salvation, into relationship. The gift of grace is faith. What is it for? Well, it's for, it's, it's for more than not just sinning. This faith that he's given us, this measure of faith that he's given us, is for more than not just sinning. It's for us to actually begin to live out the abundant life that he promised us in 1010, in John 1010. Well, how does all that work? Well, here's how it works. And I believe, I, I'm, I mean, as I'm unpacking it in my own life, I want to press more into it. Because here's what I think. And look at it in, in, in Matthew chapter 10. If you have a Bible turn there, they'll bring it up on the screen. But in Matthew chapter 10, I want to set the background because I'm not going to have time to read all the scripture that might be involved in this. But understanding where we're at is the parable of talents. And the, the, the interesting part of this whole story is, is that if you'll remember in the story, the, the, um, the manager who is the Lord, he's going, on a, he's going on a long journey, going away for a long time. And he gives each one of his servants a measure or a talent according to their ability. Well, the, guess what? This talent or sometimes talents, right? which we can draw into God's gifting that he's given us. We can draw that there. God has given us different giftings. He's given us talents. He's given us um, uh, mindsets and, and, and uh, personalities to glorify him. And each one, God has given a measure of this to each person and according to your ability. So God has given you a measure of faith according to your ability. This is the cool thing. As, as I've been unpacking this over the last few weeks, this is the cool thing about this. And I don't know why it took me so long to come to this conclusion, but because I preached this message at the farm last week uh, and about the talents, right? Well, here's what the, the cool thing about this was. And maybe it's just an aha moment for me. And maybe you all know this already. So if you did, just play along with me. Make me feel good tonight. But the thing is, is that God looks at these, this measure of faith that he's given you. And when you take that measure of faith and you double it, what's the response to the doubling? Well done, my good and faithful servant. The principle here is, is that the measure of faith that you have, live out of the measure of faith that you have. And when you do that, when you're faithful in that, guess what he's going to do? 
He's going to give you more faith. See, here's the thing is that how many people here in the room have prayed, oh, Lord, just give me more faith? How many people have prayed that prayer? Come on, man. Almost, I bet you, if the truth be known, everyone in the room but John has prayed that prayer. But here's what I know. Here's what I know is I know that in that prayer, you will get more of a measure of faith if you use the faith you've already been given. But many of us, hear me now, because I know I was there. I know how you feel. I felt the same way, but this is what I found out. I found out that when I begin to use the measure of faith that I've been given, I get more. I get more faith. He begins to pile it on. He begins to anoint me with faith, if you will. Well, how do I do that? How do I use the measure of faith that I have? Well, number, the number one thing is I, as I looked through my life and started to begin to identify some areas of faith, I begin to, I, you know, I obviously begin to step out more and more for the Lord. As, as I was, my faith was building, the Lord was giving me more. So that not only could I take one step here, he would give me a, the ability to take two more steps over there. But I had to use the faith that I've been given in order to get more. It says here in, um, in Matthew chapter 25, I think I give you verse 29. It's for, for, to, for to everyone who has will be more given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Now think about this when it comes to faith. Because when we reconcile some of the people in our lives that we know that have come to know Jesus, but aren't living for him, this plays so true. They're not, they're not utilizing the faith that God, the measure of faith that God's given them. They're not utilizing it. And so what happens? They take themselves right out of the faith. They take themselves right out of the faith because they're not using. It's not that they've lost their salvation. That's for, that, Listen, don't get all muddied up in the, in the weeds with that deal. But here's what I'm telling you is that, that many people, they don't experience God because they don't use any of the measure of faith that they've been given. When they use the measure of faith they've been given, they begin to experience God a little bit more. And all of a sudden they're like, wow. And the Lord pours a little bit more faith on them. And when he does, man, they're experiencing him even more. And so you want more faith? Use the measure of faith that God's given you right now. Well, how do I know what the measure of faith that I have? How do you do that? How do you figure that out? Well, you read and what you can accept and what you can go there. And so, you know, we just read a passage about, about you know, prophecy, teaching. We just read a passage about, about um, being uh, encouragers. Well, you know, Rick, I'm, I'm not really up into that prophecy stuff. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I don't think I know the Bible good enough to teach. Okay, I get that. But how about some of them other ones that were talked about? How about being an encourager? Can you encourage somebody? We can encourage people. Anybody can encourage somebody. Come on. Seriously. You can find something something in somebody's life to encourage them. And so we can be an encourager. And as the Lord pour, as we use that faith and the Lord pours more on us, who knows what's going to go on from there. Pretty soon, man, you're going to be praying for people. Oh my gosh, what would happen then? Right? Wow, I'm using a little bit of my faith that God has poured out. I mean, I'm praying for people. And all of a sudden, somebody goes, hey, listen, I'm having this issue. Do you mind praying for me? And you're like, man, I don't never pray for anybody for a healing before, but... Here it goes. And all of a sudden, the Lord, as you step out, the Lord pours more faith on you, and all of a sudden, somebody gets healed. You're like, whoa, what the heck just happened? And all of a sudden, your mind begins to expand, and the ends of the box that you got God put in begins to kick down, and you begin to press into the faith that he wants to give you. Because he wants to, here's the great thing. God will give you more faith. God will give you all the faith you can handle. Just use what you've been given. That's the, that's the great thing about this. This is so easy as you, when you look at it, it's so easy to understand the, the gifts that God has given us. We're supposed to be using them. It's so interesting that, you know, as I look at, again, back to 
looking at my life as I've been trying to press into the Lord. And, and you know, for, for, it's so crazy. For years, I've been praying for the gift of tongues. God had already given me a measure of faith for the gift of tongues. But I wouldn't press into it. And the moment I pressed into it, guess what he did? He gave me the gift of tongues, but then he poured on another measure of faith. And I believe that's how this gig works, is that as you step out for the Lord in the measure of faith that you have, because it's, big, it's, it's very clear in Scripture that he gives you a measure of faith according to your ability. So, yes, you may not be a Billy Graham right now, or you may not be an Abraham, or you may not be a, a, the Apostle Paul. But here's the thing. You can be. God's willing if you are. Think about that. There's, a, I don't know, that I, there's probably 35 or 40 people in this room tonight. Do you th think about if we just begin to press into the measure of faith that we've give, been given, what could happen in our center of influence? What could happen? Well, people could be encouraged. Oh, imagine that. Does our world and people in our world need a little encouragement? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, we could start praying for people. Or you, or you could do this, and I know I'm really going to meddle in when I say this, right? Ready? Uh, how about one, one who contributes in generosity? What if you want one of those people? You know, here's the thing. God, God uses all the things in our lives that he's given us and the measure of faith that he's given us to get a, a kingdom expansion. God is a multiplier if you haven't figured this out yet. He wants to multiply what he's given you continually. And he never wants you to get stale. See, many of us, we, we get the measure of faith for salvation, right? We get the get out of hell free card. Oof, got that done. But then we never press into the full measure of faith that he's given us to start with. Because you've been called, you've been equipped. And it's so much more than just not sinning, folks. Of course, the measure of faith, the measure of grace in faith that is given is to renounce the darkness, right? We all know uh, Titus 2.16. It's to renounce the darkness in our life. Absolutely. There's no question about that. But we can't stop there. We got to press into what God is doing, doing in us and through us. And that's where we begin to experience this abundant life. This is where we begin to experience something more than ourselves. When we get our eyes off ourselves, and we get them on other people, we get them on God. Imagine that. We get them on God, and God begins to be, be um, worshipped. You see, the crazy thing is, is that when we come on a Saturday night or Sunday morning to worship God, many times when people say this, they say, well, I come to worship, and, and you know, they, they think that the music, the only part of the service that's worship is the music. And that's not true. The whole service is worship, but here's the, where the worship is. It's in the response to the messages you've heard through the music, through the testimonies, through the prayer, and through the preaching of his word. When you respond, you worship because guess what you're doing? You're coming into belief. You're co hopefully coming out of unbelief and moving into belief. You're coming out of being unfaithful to into being faithful. Because if you looked at John, or Matthew chapter t uh, 25, what's he, what's he say? He says, my good and faithful servant. He's looking for some faithful servants. That's what he's looking for. As I mentioned last week, it, that, that the, um, that's the goal. I mean, the goal, the goal to our Christian life is to stand before the Lord and say, and, and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's kind of the goal. Uh, you know, and, and so what, what, is, what is this all about? Well, when we become a good and faithful servant, you know, we use the measure of, of faith that he's given to us. But I also want to point out, I feel like I have to do this. I hate to do it, but I have to do it because I need to point out something to you. Because, y'all, see, here's the thing. Pastor Lee and myself, we like to give you both sides of the fence. And, and we, all, we believe that you are intelligent people and that you can make a choice for yourself. And so here's the choice that you get to make tonight, right? You get to make this choice. On one side of the fence, using the measure of faith that you've been given to get more, the end game of that is, well done, my good and faithful servant. To stick with the measure of faith that you have 
And not using what you've been given, you get this. In verse uh, in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 25, uh, picking it up in verse 10, but his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. That's what you get. You wicked and slothful servant. You didn't use what I give you. Why would I give you any more? What's the end game of that? Cast into worth, cast this worthless servant into the utter darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know if that's hell, but I, here's what I do know. I don't want to be there. Wherever that is, I don't want to be there. I don't want to know gnashing of teeth. You know, and I never really knew what that meant, that gnashing of teeth. Until, this is going to be really bad. I never knew what that meant until um, probably a Thanksgiving of 2009, I think it was. I had a, where, where we live, where Jill and I have our house, is backs up to a, a couple hundred acres of pasture land. And some wild hogs decided to declare, declare war on my property. And they destroyed about two acres of my property up one side of my property. And well, you know, me being me, I declared war back on them. And so I caught like 25 of them in a trap. And, you know, what was so interesting, and, and when I caught this one big um, boar hog, he was huge. He was so big. He was like, he rubbed his head raw and his back raw on my cage. He was so big. And when I put him into the, in the cage, all I could see was him chomping. And I felt like it, you know what I mean, Jerry, you've seen him chomp like this. And the, it some, kind of, I felt like the Lord said, that's what gnashing of teeth is when their mouth is just chomping down, just chomping like they're so mad. And that's what gnashing of teeth is. Could you imagine doing that for hours and hours and hours? What's your jaw and your, your, you know, I can just imagine my jaw would be just excruciating pain and my head would just be pounding. That's what, that's kind of what hell is going to be like. Want you some of that? I'm kind of the hellstone, brimstone preaching here tonight, haven't I? But here's the, here, here's. The, the, the kind of, you know, hopefully you've got the crux of the message tonight is that, that the faith that pleases God is the faith that gets used. The faith that pleases God is the faith that gets used because when you use it up, he's willing to give you even more. He's up there right now. He's got a 500 gallon drum of faith that he's willing to pass, uh, pour out on you. And you've only used 35 of the 55 gallons that you've already been given. Man, what you waiting for? Press into the faith that he wants to give you. Press into it. What would happen if the 40 of us just got totally on fire and the Lord was, Lord was working overtime just to pour more faith on us? What would happen then? I think the world would change. That's just me. You know, um, one of the things that, that in Luke chapter 16, and I'll, and I'll try and get this thing finished up. In Luke chapter 16, I want to pick it up in verse 10. The one who is faithful with the very little is also faithful in the much. And the one who is dishonest in the very little is also dishonest in the much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant could serve two masters for either... He will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Why did I put this verse in here? Because this is all talking about, really talking about money and, 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 and dishonesty and stuff like that. But here's what I'm trying to communicate here is that the principle is the same principle. God has given you something. When you don't use it or you're unfaithful with it, He's going to take it away. He's going to give it to somebody else. Well, you're not going to get any more. And here's what I know. I know it from experience is that I need more faith. I want more faith. But here's what I also learned over those last few weeks is that I'm not going to get any more until I've used what he's already given me. 
I'm not going to get any more. Why would he give me more than any, why would he give me any more? Here's what I know about God. He doesn't waste anything. So he's not going to waste a bunch of faith on me if I'm not willing to use it. He gives each one a measure to their ability. But here's what I also know is that he's willing to expand our ability through our faith. That's the great thing about our God. We sang about it earlier that he is a good, good God. Well, he's so good that he gives us this faith to start with. Even just a measure of faith to come to salvation. He gives that to us. And so tonight, if you're in the room tonight and you've never intentionally given your life to Christ, know that God has given you a measure of faith for salvation tonight. He's given you a measure of faith for salvation tonight. Here's all you need to do to exhibit that faith. Just come to him. Just step to him and say, Lord, here I am. I'm a mess. And I need you. I can't do this gig no more. Here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that everyone has been given a a measure of faith. My question is, what are you doing with yours? My prayer is, is, is it's more than just not sinning. Please, please don't let it just be that. There's so much more to our Christian walk than not sinning. Here's what I want you to feel. According to your ability, you've been given faith according to your ability. But it doesn't have to stop there. God wants to give you more. Yes, even you. He wants to give more faith to you. Will you use what you already have to get more? And of course, here's what I want you to do. I want you to respond. I want you to respond. Hey, listen, I'm not, I make no, no uh, um, apologies for this tonight. If you want more faith, God's willing to give you more faith. But it's got to be in a response. God's willing to give you more faith. Use the faith you have and respond by asking for more. How many want a fresh anointing of faith? How many want a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life for faith to walk this thing out? Not only not to not to stop sinning, but to be a, a salt and light into this world. Because that's really where the abundant life is. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't sit around at night thinking about how I can't not sin anymore. I sit around at night thinking about how I can step into the glory of God in what he's doing in humanity. That excites me. That excites me about getting, getting in, 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 in um, pressing into the faith that God's willing to give me. That excites me, and I hope it excites you. God is calling you to use the measure of faith that you have. And so if you're here tonight, and maybe you haven't used the measure of faith that God has given you, and start tonight. Use that measure of faith. Some of you, some of you are so scared. Where's that coming from? Well, here's where I know it's not coming from. It's not coming from the Lord. It's not coming from the Lord. Might be coming from the enemy. Might be coming from you. Who gives a flying flip? It's not the Lord. So why are we paying attention to it? We need to press into what God has got for us tonight. In faith. What's that look like? I don't know, but it's exciting. I don't. I don't know because as a, because God. Listen, God is a God of creation. He's not going to do things. He doesn't normally do things the same way over and over and over again, does he? You think he's going to do something this way and he does what? He does something totally opposite, right? I think that, you know, the God's going to supply a need this way and he does it some way else. He's good like that. Here's what we need to do. We need to let God be God and figure out we're not God and just press into the faith that he's been given us. And so tonight, um, what I want to do is I want to just pray for you. And then those that, that are, those that are serious, listen, if the Lord's kind of um, putting this burden on your heart for more faith, we want to pray tonight that you would receive more faith. But listen, don't make no mistake about it. If you haven't used the faith that you got, you might want to come and ask, Lord, Lord, where can I use the faith that I've got? 
Because he's not going to give you any more until you begin to use what you have. So the Lord wants to do something in your life tonight. If you're that person tonight that doesn't know him and you, you've been drawn, just a measure of faith to get you through the door, to give your life to him, that person tonight, he wants to know he's specifically and intentionally pulled you to this spot. All you got to do is say. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I just I come to you tonight, Father God. I thank you for the opportunity, Lord, you give me to preach. I thank you for the, the measure of grace that you've given me and everyone in the house, Father God. Lord, I pray as we press into this grace and, and faith that you've given us, Lord, that we would honor you with our responses, Father God. Lord, that we would actually ask for more and live out of the more. Lord, that we would use what we have and pray for more. And so, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray for more faith for everyone in the room in the name of Jesus. Faith, we just pray, Holy Spirit, just, just overwhelm us with faith, Lord. Overwhelm us with faith that we can go and be your hands and feet in our community, in our center of influence, and in our world for your glory and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, listen,